Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Lauren Randall, business strategist for employee health and benefits at Marsh McLennan. So good morning, everyone. <laughs> I am Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I am the CEO at New York Bio. We are very excited you're joining us for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. We have Lauren Randall from Marsh McLennan with us this morning. Um, a special thank you to Marsh McLennan for sponsoring this month's series of breakfast. We've been very excited to have them as both a member of New York Bio and as a partner over this last year. Um, so as always, housekeeping, please. We know you may have questions for Lauren as we go through the course of our conversation with her today. Please put those either in the chat or the Q&A, and Derek and I will get to those throughout the course of the conversation. With that, I will kick it over to Derek um, to more fully introduce Lauren and start our conversation. All right. Good morning, Lauren. Excited to have you here. We are going to cover kind of probably the back part of, of biotech that we don't get to th that often. You know, you can serve as kind of architects and builders and things behind the scenes. And before we get there, why don't we talk a little bit about how you got where you are today? So tell us, you know, wind the clock back. Let's go with a little bit of an origin story and tell us how you started. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I was reading a very interesting article that said um, insurance tends to be second to last pick behind sanitation in terms of a field that people go into. And I joke around, most of the people that I work with, we didn't plan on being in insurance. Um, I was a writer. I come from a long line of writers, journalism graduate. But when I was 19 in college, I went through a major health crisis. And I was sick for about seven years. Oh, my God. Um, you know, went through a point in time where I lost the inability to read and write for a little bit. You know, I was diagnosed with Crohn's, was diagnosed with Lyme disease, neurological Lyme disease, and was able through diet and lifestyle changes and sort of taking, I call it being the CEO of your own health, um, doing what I could to take control of my health and the lifestyle factors and environmental factors that were quote unquote triggers or, you know, helped contribute to my decline. So I was able to reverse my condition you know, still work very hard and I'm very disciplined about my lifestyle and what I eat and what I do. Um, but that experience, dealing with the healthcare system and the health insurance system, watching my parents struggle through that, getting so many bills, not knowing what they were for, I really, it developed a fire in me to fix the problem. And I didn't know how I was going to fix the problem, but I thought the first step was understanding the labyrinth that is healthcare and health insurance. And I stumbled into an internship position at an insure tech company in Wisconsin. Um, at that point, I was just so happy to have formally graduated from college that I was just doing everything and anything I could to get a full-time internship. I was working part-time at Starbucks. So I was just super excited to be in an office dressed like a, a you know, yeah. career person and have this opportunity. And so within three months, I was given a full-time position in any field that I wanted. And I thought I would choose content writing because that's sort of my natural strength. But my inclination was to move into sales. Um, which was interesting. I just found sales was very interesting. Every single day was different. You're talking to different people. I was learning. I could apply my own creativity and craft to it. Um, and then, you know, lo and behold, several years after that, I was consulting with brokers across the country on, look, gone are the days of collecting six-figure commissions and taking people out for a round of golf. You actually have to bring value to the table. There's so much technology, analytics, um, resources that you can use to help employers. And, you know, at a certain point, everyone said, why aren't you a broker yourself? Why are you telling brokers how to do their job? And I moved from the Midwest to New York City is where my job is. I live in Connecticut, and I have been doing that for seven years now. All right. Well, no, you have to answer your own question. Yeah. Why? 
are you telling brokers rather than being a broker yourself? What's that? Why? Yeah. So why were you telling brokers rather than being a broker? <laughs> I, you know, it didn't even occur to me. Well, it did at certain point. I was making 80 cold calls a day to brokers ac across the country and very interesting conversations to say the least, but it occurred to me, you know, in certain areas, the competency of these people, they really didn't care about the things that they should care about. And that really sparked in me just a desire to change the industry. And I saw, you know, health insurance as being that first step towards my goal of trying to repair a system that is fragmented. And many times, unfortunately, the people who are hurt the most are the people who are the sickest. So, yeah, so that's where that journey started. There's also a little bit that when you're, you know, when you had to kind of, you know, fight and struggle to get where you are, there's usually an instinct to say, okay, how can I be good at the thing that I'm doing, right? And you don't necessarily, you know, I, I imagine it doesn't necessarily click and occur to you. It's like, wait a minute, I'm telling all these people what to do. I could very easily do that, right? But you're, a, a lot of times you can get wrapped up in just, you know, the the focus that kind of got you there in the first place makes you a little bit myopic, right? It makes you kind of dig in and say, what's the thing that I have to do now? And it kind of puts a little bit of blinders on you in terms of what else is out there sometimes. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, but let's actually dig in here and talk a little bit about, so talk a little bit about Ascension, right? So you, you, you've got to this thing, you, you're, you're moving up the ladder. What are some of the things that were important to you in terms of kind of taking that next step? And we can get into mentorship and a few things here. We're going to go there. Uh, this morning, but why don't we just kind of get there organically? So let's let's go through, you know, so how did you actually do this? How did you how did you, you know, basically get to the situation where it's like, no, I'm gonna I'm moving to New York. Uh, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna go take my next step. I'm gonna go do this. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was really interesting. And I talk a lot about how chronic illness was a catalyst for me to become exceptional in the workplace, because Everything that I did, wake up in the morning, you have to take your medications, do your therapies, go to your appointments. You know, I was in college drinking barium and walking over to the medical center getting CT scans. It changes the way you live your life, but you're used to this regimented, rote, disciplined lifestyle that's about someday. It's not about today. It's every day, every minute, every meal, how is it going to get me to where I want to be? And that actually really helped me be successful in the workplace because the, the adversity that maybe my colleagues or my counterparts were experiencing felt like nothing to me. I was just happy to be there, right. happy to be in the office. And so, you know, I hadn't formally graduated yet when I had this internship and I was fighting for a full-time position. And I was just so happy to be able to maybe move out of my parents' house. And I had a little bit of imposter syndrome because when you're three or four years behind your peers and you're the oldest intern there, you're like, yeah. do I belong here? You know, so that really pushed me to think about, we had this one market research project and we were using spreadsheets and I, I went up to our chief product officer and said, is there a way that we can do this more efficiently? Can we add embed a hyperlink in this that automatically pulls this to Google so that we don't have to individually type this in over and over? Mm -hmm. And I worked with him on that and collaborated with another department. And um, the chief operating officer brought me into his office and he was like, Lauren, you know, you've only been here a month and you're collaborating with our C-suite on how to make this process more efficient. Like you can work in any department you want. And that was a great lesson to me yeah. of how you can take initiative and just the power of visualization. You know, I dressed for the job I wanted, not the job that I was in. I got there early. Um, we had an eight week intensive boot camp, and I studied every single day. I, I really, I was so worried about losing my shot. And I felt like this was my only shot that I just dove in and dedicated everything to that position. Um, and I still have kept that work ethic and that drive, but 
the reason I moved all the way out here is I actually, you know, cold called a broker and it was a large enterprise broker and I was selling them on our product suite. And he was like, what are you doing? Why are you in this job? Why don't you come work for us? I have a twin sister who's in fashion design in Brooklyn at the time. And he's like, we'll fly you out to New York city. You can visit your sister, no pressure. Um, and we'll take you out here. And I ended up, you know, after a six month, very rigorous process, moving over to a firm out here. Um, but it was, it was a crazy story because I moved here. It took a month to get my stuff. So I had a, an air mattress for about a month by myself in Stanford. And, um, you know, I got to the office and the whole courting process ended up being great. But once I left, you know, their private equity firm and went to their actual location, this woman was setting up my computer and she's like, you're the first person they've hired in 10 years in sales. And <laughs> I had a, like a calculator that plugged into the wall and I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, so That's regret funny. immediately set in um, and it was scary. And I was trying to build a network from scratch in a large cutthroat city, you know, where Midwestern nice is looked at with a little bit of suspicion and trepidation. And so, right. just yeah, little... yeah, just a little bit. Right. And um that kind of fed into Derek Women to Women Exchange and how that kind of helped with my success. So we can talk about that at a later point. But yeah, that that's kind of the ascension and then the plateau, if you will, and um, and then further ascension after that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, listen, you've kind of you've the stuff that you're talking about is is not you know industry specific, right? I mean, it's you know if you're there and you kind of outwork everybody around you, there there's really no there's no substitute for hard work, for focus, for anything. And it's a story that repeats over and over again, where when folks get dedicated and kind of put their mind to it, they they end up doing really good things. And the nice thing in healthcare, and really the nice thing about what your story is here is that it all started with, you know, a personal experience where you say, this can be fixed and this can be better. And I don't, I don't know that there's a single patient anywhere that looks around and says everything is fine. Right. You know, the number of people that we've talked to that, you know, either through their healthcare experience or their kids' healthcare experience turned around and said, you know, we need to help fix this. Uh, you know, we've done 150 of these now, and I'd say a good half of them start that way. Right. It's just over and over and over again is how the industry invents itself and get better. Absolutely. We just gave a CFO summit and one of we brought in a a research company and one of the topics was the patient is not all right. Um, you know, hospital providers, they're really struggling right now. Beds are full, the profits are down. Um, we really have to, whether it's healthcare or health insurance, I don't want to say blow up the model because it's 18% of our GDP. And we all know that there's different tentacles and pieces of this that cannot be dismantled overnight. But, you know, I love coming to even the annual meeting, Jennifer, for New York Bio, and you hear these stories about how people are really rethinking chronic illness, autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. What are these triggers? I think COVID was a catalyst for us really rethinking chronic conditions. And that's, you know, 50% of our population has a chronic condition. And there's an opportunity there. When we look at productivity, it's not, do they work remote? Do they work from home? It's these underlying chronic conditions that are impacting people's ability to fully be present at work. And how do we move the needle there? It's, are, it's fun. Go ahead, Jennifer. You no, know, I was just going to say, what are you seeing? Like, let's drill down a little bit, right? So what are you seeing yeah. from clients as how they're starting to address that? Or some, obviously, I'm assuming you think some do are doing it better than others, and some are further down the road. Talk to us about a little bit what that looks like from a, not best practices, but maybe the right practices. Absolutely. So there's multiple components to this, and I think it's shifting and it's evolving. Right now, I mean, it's no surprise. Kaiser just released their survey. Um, insurance costs are going up seven to eight percent and that's trend you know so that's not even impacting a company that's trending poorer than that and typically 
depending on where you are, you know, if you're smaller, your, your rates are your rates, your renewal is your renewal. If you're larger, there's some autonomy there, some ability to impact costs. But all across the board, companies are hurting and they're trying to figure out what to do because insurance is continuing to go up year over year. So when you break that down, I think there's a lot of different facets to it. And you can't just look at one area. You really have to look at everything. So the first thing I would say is, is looking at productivity. Um, how are you looking at burnout within your workforce? Mental health issues in particular. That continues to be a topic that people are looking at and analyzing. What can I do to better enhance mental health benefits for my employees? Um, it's controlling the levers that you have available to you based on your size and doing everything you can in those areas to narrow down costs. And then, you know, if you're a larger employer, it really is about not perfectly Pareto's principle, but typically tends to be a handful of people are driving close to 60 to 70% of your claims. So how are you drilling down into those specific individuals to determine what their value, what their care is and how to drive them towards high quality providers, maybe bundled surgery centers, preventative care um, to really decrease costs long-term. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You, you talk a little bit about burnout and this is something that I, that I wanted to get into because we don't actually, it's not something that I think that's widely discussed. And, you know, we, we should recognize that we are on, you know, we have, we are, let's say we're coming out of an epoch where, you know, everything got changed up ended and, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of synergies and efficiencies to be taken out of that, but also there's no, there's no set model anymore. And right? I think people have kind of thrown away the notion that, you know, everyone should be in an office from nine to five, Monday to Friday. Right. I think that's, that's probably gone. Right. But there's no blueprint now, or there's, there's probably a few blueprints now. So how are we handling? Yeah, I'm getting it. How are we? How are we, so? How are we handling burnout? Number one, and how do we handle kind of this amorphous thing where there's no easy precedent that everyone is doing that you can just look at and say this is whatever we should do because that's what everyone else does. Yeah, it's a really interesting time. So during the past few years, I I host HR roundtables. Um, there's about thirty leaders that attend once a month. And the biggest topic was burnout. And honestly, it got to a point where we were burnt out with talking about burnout. I could see and that. So yeah, no, that's a Seinfeld like... episode right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we kind of abandoned it, but it was really this discussion around, and, and life sciences in particular is at the helm of this, is overnight worlds changed. And we had to operate at what I think a psychotherapist called surge capacity. Mm -hmm. So you're really, and, and you're pushed up by all this adrenaline releasing, you're, you have a collective mission together as a community, we need to band together, we need to get through this, and you're working around the clock, and it's yep. an incredible thing. At the same time, you're, you're kind of fueled by fear and uncertainty, but at a certain point, you can't operate at surge capacity in the long term, and yeah. many of us have had to operate at surge capacity, waiting for that time to end, waiting for that pandemic to end, waiting for things to return back to normalcy. And it really, talking to a lot of burnout experts and organizational effective management consultants, it's a conversation about, we got to remove that, that concept that things are going to return back to normal. And we have to figure it figure out how to not operate at surge capacity and downshift. And that's really hard because many of us, whether it's cutting operational expenses, being leaner, you know, operating in a different environment, digitizing the experience, we've put in place these systems that really have normalized surge capacity and our people are burnt out. So there's a lot of things that can be done and I'm happy to share my guide to after this conversation, but we need to be a lot more flexible 
And this week, I'm actually, for my HR roundtable, we're hosting a conversation with four different consultants on the four-day work week, which Jen and I were talking about, and we were like, that, you know, it doesn't seem like it applies to the life sciences space. But when I started to talk to the CEO of Four Day Week Global and the two people who have implemented Four Day Work Week strategies with other companies, these companies are um, Panasonic, you know, BuzzFeed, ThreadUp. They're large organizations that have frontline workers or they have workers in plants or they have people in labs. So it's mm-hmm. going to be really interesting. You know, they talked about flexibility being key. Maybe it's not the four day work week, but flexibility has kind of been the mantra that things are shifting toward. Not so much remote versus on site, but how are we flexible with our people? And one of the burnout experts said that the biggest thing you can do to banish burnout, it's not perfect, but having shared values and community, which goes right back to company culture. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have shared values and community, is it okay if your kid walks in the room when you're on a Zoom? Is it okay to leave work early to pick up the dry cleaning? What kind of culture are you creating and are your core values that you created you know, as a seed company, early stage company, still, still maintaining the integrity of that as you grow and scale? And do they help people feel connected to the mission and vision of the organization so that they can, it helps you feel a little bit less burnout when you feel there's meaning towards the work that you're doing and that you're right. working within a community. Right. There's, there's the, the feeling of being in a place where you're you know, valued and understood and not like there's some, you know, faceless pressure around you to do uh, whatever you're you're doing. Uh, it, it's funny you you mentioned your your child being on a Zoom. I I winding back to the very first episode we ever did here. We had you know Craig Lipset was our guest who is a he's a big name in in decentralized trials, huge at the time because he was he was everywhere and he was our first guest. And with two minutes left in the in the thing, we're we're basically wrapping up. And my then eight year old comes in, realizes he's on camera, and started to floss in the background, <laughs> which I was I was mortified. Right? I didn't know. And and Craig handled it wonderfully. He, he's just a smooth operator in in all of these things, and handled it amazingly. And we still joke about it to this day. But in that moment, it's like, oh, my God, we have started this thing. I didn't know how this was going to turn out. And my son is literally dancing in the background. And the first one, you know, we're never doing this again. It's ruined, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it is funny, though, because I feel like it's created a levity and a human element, which is interesting. I mean, I work with a lot of hedge funds, and I was giving a formal presentation during covid to a very large hedge fund. And it was, you know, very important high stakes conversation. And at the time, my fiance and I had to share an office and he had to leave the room and he crawled on the floor so he wouldn't be on camera. And you can just see him crawling on the floor behind the camera. And we all just burst out laughing. And, you know, it created, I think, a human element to the formality that actually I think we're all kind of craving a little yeah. bit from everything we've been through. So it's interesting. Well, that was one of the things that I thought was interesting about kind of the entire, you know, pandemic and the uptick of the Zoom experience was that you're all kind of, you know, it wasn't it wasn't how we wanted to do anything, but it was how we had to do something. And we were all learning something new at the same time, right? So, you know, when there's no norms as to everyone, it was kind of a grounding and leveling thing where, we're all in the same exact situation together. We're doing the best we can. And that's really, you know, those kind of situations are ones where, you know, you get kind of, you know, empathy and compassion and, and the whole bit. Yeah. And, and then, and I think it's interesting to take it one step further. So like then people have obviously sort of gone back into quote the office at different rates and different, right. Different patterns and in somewhat industry driven, but somewhat individual driven. I know my husband was back in the office in July of 2020. And I was like, you know, sort of like, why, right? Because he's not 
Uh, I mean, he, he's an office in the office and he was like, well, you were telling me that the divorce rates were going to go up. And so I was like, no, I didn't. He goes, yes, you did. <laughs> so like, what are, what, what did you see as people, are we at steady state now, right? With, are people in the office, if they're going to be in the office, are they remote? If they are going to be remote, like, what are you seeing sort of as trends? Absolutely. So from a life sciences perspective, it's really been contingent on the organization and where they're at in the growth continuum. I definitely think smaller organizations tend to want people to come in to help build that culture and that community, but most are still emphasizing a flexibility in that, even if they have labs. So maybe it's three times a week. Um, we haven't seen a lot of organizations say five times a week. The ones that have a steady stream and want people in the office are creating environments that are conducive with having people in the office. So having a really nice setup having collaborative sessions, having happy hours, um, setting up time. Because one of the other things that kind of happened inadvertently during COVID was departmental divides or departments start to kind of operate in silos. They deal with the teams that they deal with day in and day out and they don't deal with the other teams. And so creating this environment where there are get togethers, there are concerted efforts towards creating collaboration opportunities outside of your core team and the core people that you see um, has been important. And I would say outside of that, just you know, trying to maintain the integrity of the culture, which does involve a lot of in-person. There's no other energy like New York City. So I think people are dedicated to getting people back into the office, but just try to be more intentional about that. And I think that's what's so interesting about the four day work week, because I really thought it was kind of a pipe dream. But the more that I talk to consultants about it and look at the model and see these companies, Amazon is rolling out the four day work week, um, obviously to a small sect of their people and they're piloting it. But four day work week is really more about being super intentional with your time and saying no to things that don't generate you know, a, a positive return or a waste of your time saying no to meetings that really are just kind of meetings for the sake of meetings and having Friday or whatever that day is be more of a flex day for work that hasn't gotten done yep. through your four days. So it's going to be interesting to see how this flexibility model starts to shift and change because that seems to be what a lot of companies are using is just be more flexible with people um, and their needs. Do you, do you think that, so I, can we drill down on this a little bit? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued, skeptical, but intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I, I, one thing you said was like a potential for kind of quote, saving the things that you didn't get done. And that could be something, let's say, you know, like the, your Friday morning, you're knocking out emails and yeah. things like that. How, how are companies that have implemented that? I think that in theory for me, that sounds good. But then like once you start shooting out emails or responding to people, you're going to get incoming back. And then all of a sudden it's just a regular work day, right? So how are companies thinking about that to put guardrails around it, but yet still get stuff done? A hundred percent. So I would love to say I have the answer to that. But maybe you have to attend Thursday, Jen, because I have that question as well. And it's interesting, Natasha, who's going to be joining as the chief people officer of a company called Goose Chase, and she works at a venture capital fund that has rolled out the four-day work week. And she was like, I, I almost don't want to call it the four-day week work, work week. It's really about flexibility and meeting a company where they're at in terms of what makes sense to them. But she was like, I'll tell you, there was a real transition period from actually implementing a four-day work week and then actually dealing with the fallout of what people thought it was going to be right. and then post-implementation what issues are you dealing with so i'll report back to you on that because i'm just as curious i mean and we're talking about new york we're talking about the northeast our culture and our work ethic is through the roof so it'll be interesting to hear from these panelists on how something like this could be integrated. But I'm still hopeful that maybe some of the tenants and principles of this strategy can be 
leveraged in a way that allows people to downshift from this surge capacity. Because I think that's the larger issue is this burnout is making it really hard for people and the hybrid work environment makes it a lot harder to create those traditional boundaries between work and life. Those lines have blurred. And in some ways that's good. And in other ways, you can never turn off and recharge. And that creates a problem. Yep. And it's funny, you're talking about, you know, venture capital and private equity, which are not exactly bastions of the work-life balance movement, right? These are not these are not necessarily industries that have that have classically uh, you know, been terribly sensitive to that. But you know, at, at the heart of it, I, I I think people I think people are better at what they do when they enjoy what they do and when the rest of their life is actually uh, good and decent. Um, so I actually want to make sure that we get to let, let's let's stick on this a little bit, but I actually want to get to your women to women network, right? Because a lot of what we're talking about is kind of support culture and recognition and a lot of you know things that roll into that and. You know, I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, I, not that I'm, the, I, I think in a lot of ways, there are things that, that we, the Royal, we take for granted. And there are certainly a lot of places that that can improve. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, this network and how it started? Because I think the story behind it is really good. And let's talk about that because I think there's, I think there's a bunch of really, really good stuff here that we should get into. Sure. So you know, when I moved to New York City and I had no network and I was working in the insurance industry, and we have a joke within the insurance industry that, you know, you're not experienced unless you have gray hair. And so you coming in as a young Midwestern woman, and at the time I was working with a lot of hedge funds in the investment management community, you're at you're almost at a competitive disadvantage out of the door. You have to overcompensate for potentially the, the prejudgments someone might have about your ability and your experience level. And I was having a really hard time getting my foot in the door. And at the time, I looked at and was researching a lot of alternative investment funds and women who work in C-suite in that industry. And I would find press releases or articles and I would just reach out to them on LinkedIn or via email and say, can I just buy you a cup of coffee? I'm not looking to sell you anything. I'm really trying to cut my teeth in this industry and better understand how I can create a better experience for you. And they were very open and very receptive. And when I met with them one-on-one -on -one and kind of talked about their challenges, it really resonated with me because I'm a team of one woman, our sales force is about 68 men and one other woman and myself. Uh, most of my career, I have been the only woman on the team over a one year period. They'll, they'll hire one to two women and then um, that person will leave. So whether I was in insure tech or whether I was here, I've always been one of the only women on the team. So I could relate a lot to these women and selfishly from a cathartic standpoint, we all came there with similar challenges. And so I said, would you like to meet other women who are kind of experiencing this as well? And they said, absolutely. And we formed Women to Women Exchange, which is really a place for women in C-suite and at any point in their career to cultivate relationships, mentorships, and business growth opportunities. So it started out as investment management focus. Now it's life sciences. It's all different industries. Because there is a there's a lot of similarities between investment management, hedge funds, and life sciences, how they look at their people, how they look at their benefits, which is something that I've figured out. But so a lot of us women, we meet all of the time to figure out how we can help and support one another, encourage one another, but also create opportunities for one another. And that's kind of morphed into this HR roundtable, but that's sort of the inception of women to women exchange. And it's not just women, I would say it's just creating inclusivity across the board. So we're talking about diversity, equity and inclusion. We're bringing in people to speak about these different concepts about unconscious bias, um, because we're so used to the lens with which we see the world. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for those who have been traditionally unseen or unheard. So how can we 
you know, promote diversity of thought, which, which ultimately means bringing people into the room who haven't been in the room before and talking about that amongst this group. How do you distinguish? So I, first of all, that I think this is great, right? Like I, I love this idea and I love that you all have, have put it into play. And I love that it grew. I, I think you should tell the story first before I ask my question about sort of the actual, like the genesis of this. Cause I've read some of the, some other interviews and you, you talked about specifically the genesis of this. Yeah. So, so, so the genesis of what specifically, sorry. Uh, <laughs> your interaction with um, Chantel and right how that all yeah happened. oh yeah absolutely so you know early in my career when I moved here and was kind of a fish out of water and obviously the first firm I went to was not a fit so I was on the second job moved to Marshall McLennan agency they had a way more kind of established operation and people like me who were learning but I was still struggling. And I remember I went to our first sales meeting and I just see this boisterous Italian Brooklyn woman, so, so strong, so articulate. And she was like, this is what we need to be doing. And my clients need this. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get to this woman because she is the key to my success. Everybody else there was a male. And you know, I would love to say we still have the same challenges, but to be honest, when you grow up all playing lacrosse and you all know the same people, there's a different level of bonding and camaraderie that takes place that really I just wasn't a part of. And when I met Chantal, she was like, I don't know, I'm, I'm super busy. And I was like, I'll wait, I'll, whatever you need me to do. I, I stalked her calendar, found time. And we got sushi together. Her daughter was in the office that day. She went with us and we just hit it off. And she was so integral to my success because one, you're looking at somebody like I can be that. Okay. This person has, you know, a $6 million book of business. That can be me one day because they're emulating that. And they're showing me that someone like me who came from a different background can, can become this. So they're emulating that, but then they're mentoring you on all of this invaluable information that you really don't get, you know, anywhere else and helping you figure out what your moral compass is, how you should operate in the work environment. So yeah, she was a genesis for that. And then she helped me co-found Women to Women Exchange together with her network and my network. And I think what was so valuable about that is it wasn't just about who's in press releases, who's C-suite. It's about who are, who are the interns, who are the younger women who need a positive figure in their lives, who have dreams and ambitions and are trying to figure things out. You know, because that's one thing we talk about, um, and we spend a lot of time within life sciences, is sort of that next generation, right? Because we, we have to, and, and are we starting earlier enough? And I think you're seeing lots of new things, even something as um, like Biobus, right? Is going into the schools and working, right? Um, much earlier, sort of elementary and even middle school to talk about science and the importance of potential careers and that sort of thing. But when you, you talk about people that are willing to engage, I think we have to also have a responsibility to create the next generation of individuals who are interested and willing to engage. And I think that has to start from us. Yeah. And, 100%. You know, I, I had this discussion, it was, a, it was a couple of weeks ago and the topic was different, but the, the genesis of everything is the same where they were they were picking on some something I don't want to go into what they were were picking on but it's one of the quote unquote woke topics right and my my point was you, you you know as the majority population you can't you can't necessarily project your privilege as, as it were onto someone that has been in a minoritized position that you frankly have never experienced and don't understand and I think one of the best things here regardless of what group that we're talking about is that there, there is and there should be a level of understanding and support for you know people who you know either are minoritized or have felt minoritized or who like you said come from you know different backgrounds and things and don't have the kind of privileged experience that has been the quote unquote norm for a really long time 
just because that's the way it was, right? And, you know, when we get past that, we end up with a much, you know, richer workplace of perspectives, point of views, until like I, I, every single thing about our industry and virtually every single industry gets better when you are more inclusive like that. And I think that's that's the main thing that I think people don't understand when they stand on a soapbox. And well, frankly, most people that use the word woke don't understand that, but. <laughs> well, and it's interesting too, because my eyes have been opened even being in life sciences of neurodiversity and neurodivergence. And, you know, I, I have a disability, it's a hidden disability, but you know, how many people who have disabilities that really it's an overused strength and we're just positioning it in the wrong way in the workplace, you know, everything that I went through, it makes me a high performer in the workplace. But if I was in an HR room and divulging this information, I might be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And it's a tough conversation because, you know, there, there are parameters on what you should share. And this is the world that we work in. And that's the reality. But how are we leveraging the strengths of people who are different than us? You know, how are we leveraging the strengths of people who may not have a traditional background or don't see the world the way that we see the world? And I think that's going to become even more critical in the years to come, because like you said, Jen, I mean, Gen Z operates very differently than us. I was just reading that millennials and Gen Z, 70% have utilized the company's mental health benefits. You know, there's all of these different trends and strategies and perspectives that come from generations and people of different backgrounds that we need to start to take into account when we're looking at the employee experience. Speaking of that, so let's say, let's give you a, um, we'll give you a, a, a scenario here, right? So, um, so Derek and I are running a company, let's say like New York Bio, right? <laughs> <laughs> Big stretch on this one, Jennifer. Big stretch. <laughs> yeah. Those who know me well know I am very. <laughs> There's a reason I'm a lawyer. Um, and <laughs> We want to, right, we want to be able to really support our employees in lots of different ways, but we're a small company. So how do you think about that if you're talking, because obviously in New York, we do have a lot of earlier stage companies and smaller companies. How do you think about that? And how do you advise companies on sort of tackling the benefits and what you want to offer and being as robust as you can while recognizing that your the company resources are not unlimited? 100%. That, that's such a great question, and it's a challenge in the New York City marketplace because New York has what's called a full large employer rule that states if you have 100 employees or less that are benefit eligible, you're basically stuck in a small group community rated bucket, which the rates are the rates, the plans are the plans, and we're talking about an industry that has best-in-class PPO out-of-network benefits as a trademark and hallmark of the industry. So that's the last place you want to be from a competitive standpoint. A lot of organizations will move into something called a PEO arrangement. Um, and it's really important, you know, you can work with an advisor, whomever it is, that's well-versed in PEOs, because depending on your growth trajectory and, and how many people you're looking to hire, you may outgrow that model. So it's really about being intentional of what this year looks like. And there's obviously a lot of uncertainty, so you don't have a crystal ball. But what does year one look like, year two, year three? If you're going to be below 100 employees for three to four years, maybe that PEO model works for you, especially if you're hiring out of state. You're dealing with new leave laws. You're dealing with registration, unemployment insurance. It's much easier to be in a PEO model. But then once you eclipse 100 employees, you've kind of maybe outgrown that model. So working with someone who can pull you out of that. And the reason that PEOs can be a good solution is they're taking a lot of that back office administrative work off of your plate. And they're also offering you many times better benefits because they're pooling the risk so they can custom the plans or make the plans a little more customized to your needs. But it is really critical to make sure you're choosing the right PEO partner you know, that's an industry that continues to evolve. And there's a lot of organizations, whether they're registered or CITES out of, of red states that can impact everything from abortion services to different 
you know, resources for you. So I would just encourage people to work with an advisor to have them take that off of your plate um, so that you're not worrying about those things. Worry about the culture of your organization and worry about the things that are really important. Find someone who can help you analyze what the best and most competitive thing is for where you're at as a company and what you plan on in the future. Yeah, that's good. And we've actually, so we, we, you know, Trinet has sponsored a, a number of these and they're, they're doing really good things in New York. We've gone through that uh, a bunch of different times. It's, it's interesting because now I think there are, I think there's probably a little more appreciation for, you know, again, thinking about how to do things differently, thinking about how to adapt to whatever the new normal is. And I think people are probably willing to kind of look at services and partnerships and groups that they've hadn't before to think about, okay, how do we actually, how do we actually change the way that we, uh, we work? Maybe we should actually look at what these regulations are and think about, you know, really kind of pointedly, how are we going to grow and what's our culture going to look like as we grow? I think there's been more focus on that, which, you know, I, I applaud, you know, I, I, again, I think that you get the most out of your people and you're going to get the most out of your company. And, yeah, absolutely. And do you see that, like, and I, I think probably state laws and regulations make a big difference yeah. here, right? So New York may have different, more, <laughs> right? Always more. <laughs> wink, wink, yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> the laws around specific, you know, offerings to employees and maybe a different state might not. Um, so, so basically reaching out to someone like you or one of your colleagues, right, Would you would be able to help a company sort of take a, like, a, okay, here's the umbrella. This is it's sort of, this is what you need to think about. These are, you know, some options and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So we typically, depending on where you are, but say you're, you're a smaller organization looking at where do we even start? You know, we can help procure proposals from multiple PEOs. We're compensated in the same fashion as if you were to go direct to the PEO, but we operate in an agnostic fashion. So you know, maybe we're looking at three different PEOs side by side and we're saying, hey, these offer employment attorneys at no cost to you. These guys have a better user experience, but they're higher in workers comp or they're higher in this area or, you know, and then there are other important benefits typically with life sciences, executive benefits. So life and disability, many times PEOs aren't competitive in those areas. So you're reversely discriminated against your highest compensated individuals. So, you know, it's helpful to just have an advisor holistically look at your program and help you figure that out and do the legwork for you because these proposals are like 50 pages. So it's better to just normalize that data in a spreadsheet and focus on the things that are most meaningful to you and, and pick a good partner because moving from one PEO to another, it's, it's a lot of work. You're switching all your tech, you're switching, you know, tax ID numbers, renewal dates. It's better to just do a little bit more work up front and have someone else help you with it to be placed in a good spot than have to switch a year or two years down the line. Can you, um, and, but I, it just occurred to me as I was thinking about that. Um, do you, can you explain to people who may or may not know just in very briefly what a PEO is? I realize. Oh, yeah. yeah. We did the whole of course. and we assume people know, but they, they may be Googling right now. Oh, totally. So PEO is a professional employer organization. And so that could be everything from JustWorks to Trinet to ADP. And they basically band together all small employers. They enter into a co-employment arrangement with you. So you share their federal tax ID number. You still retain most autonomy over certain things for your employees. But they're taking on the liability with you to offer and provide things to stay in compliance. So they take over the insurance, workers' compensation, typically employee health and benefits. And they also operate your payroll, the tax, your HRIS platform. So they're really an extension of your HR team and of your organization. And they make a lot of sense for companies who have limited bandwidth internally. They're starting. They just need to get things up and running. You're operating in multiple states, so you don't want to deal with, you know, Washington State's leave laws or registering in Massachusetts. Um, so they help with that component of it, but they also pool your risk. So instead of you purchasing 
group insurance for the medical as 10 employees, you're purchasing it as theoretically 8,000 through a large PEO. And because of that, you have more customized plans available and you also typically have cheaper costs. But you just have to be careful because the admin fees with these PEOs tend to go up every year. And once they've locked you in, they know they've locked you in. And that's where people kind of get into trouble. So that's why, you know, you can just work with someone on what things look like for you. Leaving a PEO is very difficult because you have to reestablish all of those different things. So yeah, it's, just, it's important to work with an advisor or consultant who specializes in those areas to help you determine, should I enter one? Should I just stay in the open market because we're going to be above 100 or whatever it may be? Um, because it is a, a lift to go through that process. Why don't we just, we have, a, so we have about eight minutes and I want to kind of bend back towards uh, stuff that's going to be, you know, really kind of hyper topical to our audience. So New York's biotech ecosystem is made up, really, we have a ton of smaller companies. We have a great startup scene. And, you know, I think where a lot of these companies are, they're either at the stage where they're transitioning from a seed to a series A or a series A to a series B, right? And that is not a... That's usually a time where you lay out these projections where headcount isn't just going to increase, but it's going to double or it's going to triple yeah. and it's going to do all that in about six months, right? So can we talk a little bit about what best practices look like there? Because also with these smaller companies, a lot of times you're dealing with folks and teams that haven't done it before. You know, maybe they've done it once or twice. Perhaps they came from a larger company, but there's a very good bet that the team you're working with has not actually gone through this kind of, I don't want to call it hyper growth, but we'll call it binary growth, right? Yeah. Like it's a, it's event driven and you know, it's, it's a boom explosion type growth. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what that should look like, right? What are, you know, a, when should you panic or B what should you do? So you shouldn't panic, right? It's always, it's always nice to know at some point, like whether you should be panicking or not. Sometimes the answer is yes. <laughs> Just in general, right? <laughs> yeah, a certain level of panic is helpful. No, but I think <laughs> really before that growth to be engaging with an advisor on being placed appropriately in a PEO at the outset is really important because if you work with an advisor to place you in a PEO, they're with you for the life of that account. If you go direct to that PEO, that PEO is, it, it's almost like a guy code. You're writing with them direct. They won't yeah. let an advisor work with you. And a lot of people don't know that, but the benefit to that is that that advisor can hold your hand through your growth trajectory and get you access to life sciences specific benchmarking reports. So as you grow, maybe you just needed some canned plans initially to just get up and running, but now you're doubling in headcount. How do you, you know, do you want an enhanced EAP for mental health? Do you want a bolt on solution for wellness or well being because you feel, all right, the PEO is still not as competitive as the mid market companies we're competing for talent against? Um, should we offer these two or three plans that are richer, that are more in line with our peer groups, or should we keep the traditional two to three plans that we've had at the outset? So those conversations are a lot easier when you hire an advisor at the outset. Otherwise, you may have to just hire them for a consulting fee outside of that. Uh, but those are the areas that I would say to, in particular to focus on. Focus on benchmarking. What are your peer groups doing? What are your competitors doing? And how can you align your benefit strategy to be an attractor, not a detractor when people are looking at compensation packages? The toughest part of that is just maintaining the, the culture of the organization, the integrity of the culture of the organization. And, you know, part of that, I think, is just those shared values and that community and the mission and the vision of the organization. But then making sure, too, that the benefit package is an extension of that and not just operating in a bolt-on silo because this industry offers really rich benefits. So people notice when you don't, when you stray from the norm or deviate right. from what's standard. Um, so I would say those are the, the major areas to focus on and just have a pulse to check in because, oh, I get it. Insurance is not the number one thing that keeps us up at night. That's the first thing that comes to our mind. 
But a lot of times as we go through that growth trajectory, we've scaled out of or phased out of whether it's our limits or it's different coverage on the property and casualty side, you've outgrown your policies. And you yeah. don't want to find out on the back end the hard way that you've outgrown those things. It's better to work with an advisor at the outset and have them holding your hand, doing the work um, before hitting those milestones and realizing, oh my gosh, we're underinsured or we didn't have this and we didn't do this and having to be reactive versus proactive. Yeah, I think the thing you said a second ago is really important and to reiterate this, right? There's a big, there's a, there's a huge kind of risk and downside to being quote unquote out of market whether it's whether it's in the way that you're pricing your your round or whether it's in the way that you offer your benefits or the way that you treat your team yeah. because ultimately that's a signal to everyone else that you're not where you should be right and in an industry where you know these are these are kind of you know binary markers of success you either get there or you don't you don't want the fact that you're basically out of touch with things to basically be the thing that pushes you to the side because it's as of now it's incredibly hard to raise money it's incredibly hard to get transactions done and, you know, the marketplace is squeezing. So if you do have yeah. a high functioning executing team, the last thing you want is to be pushed aside, frankly, because you you weren't current with a lot, bunch of the things that are going on in the industry. 100%. And I'll say too, when you work with a broker or advisor and they know that you're, they're competing against two or three other PEOs, or, or even if you're open market, when you're working with an advisor, the vendors that you're working with know that. And I was just in a negotiation with a smaller group and ADP or um, <laughs> I just identified that. I probably shouldn't have done that. But anyways, we didn't they, hear they it. Made no, we... Pricing, yeah, that never happened. They never made happened. major pricing con concessions in the six figures because they knew, all right, we're competing against other other vendors on the table. So that's a big deal. That's money you're losing on the table by just working direct and kind of just wanting to get something done. You're sending a signal to that vendor that they can gouge you from a pricing standpoint and nobody's really watching or monitoring that. So it's also one tip I would give is just try and work with someone at the outset so that you have more negotiating power as you grow and as you scale, because that's typically when your costs go up. So we only have two minutes left um, and I'm cognizant of everyone's time. What would you, what um, to leave us because we can't help ourselves. We have to ask the New York question. Um, so what are, what have you seen and what are you seeing um, sort of in the future for New York companies that you're working with? Yeah. So I would say, I think a lot of organizations this year are really looking at what their long-term strategy is you know, at least from a health and benefits perspective, that's what I'm seeing. I think during COVID, a lot of organizations had bigger fires to put out. Yeah. And so the benefits package was, let's just keep things as they are. We, we don't want to introduce change and disruption. We'll eat this or take this cost on the chin. That's not the case anymore. We're going into a time of a lot of uncertainty, economic uncertainty, volatility, the patient is not all right, as we said earlier. Yeah. I don't think the employee is all right either. We're all dealing with issues um, that I think we all kind of thought these things may end, but they're not ending. And so I would really say the focus is on what's my long-term strategy in terms of benefits? What's my mental health strategy for my employees? How am I effectively communicating that? And what's our flexibility strategy? Those are the top three things I would say that companies are contemplating and trying to figure out right now and how to stretch capital further in a tough time. Yep, absolutely. So Lauren, um, this conversation was, I've learned things. I We have more to come from you. You're going to come back uh, and talk to us about what you <laughs> learned from the four-day work week conversation. Uh, but thank you so much for your time today and your commitment. Um, I know I enjoy working with you personally, and I'm glad that you're in our ecosystem and working with New York bio companies. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Have a great day, everybody.